James Webster has a chat with writer Afina Tamarapa of Ngāti Kahungunu, Ngāti Ruanui descent, about her mahi as a professional museum curator and the intricacies of looking after precious Taonga Puoro collections. Kia mau tonu mai rā. Kā E a fio fio nei, ko te ngere o te nguru e nguru mai nei. Kete kete ana te kaka kuku ana te keruru titi ana te tirai raka. Ti aho aki ana i te ata hapara maafiti mai rā ko tamanu i te rā. Kia uhi wero, tau mai te oro mauri, hui e, hui e, tāi ki e. E, tau koa, hui nei, e me aki ki a koe i tēnei rangi, nau anua ki a whakai ki te hara mai. Te kōrero au kōrero e pāna tō hairinga, e pāna nā taonga pūoro, te au pūoro, tō mōhiotanga, e pāna haumanu. Koe nā ngā me mauana e koe, uh, kei runga i tō hikoi haire rungi te matoa te whenua. So koe nei, uh, te tātaua nei kōrero i tarangi nei. Uh, wao well, e mōhiona koe, uh, you know, ko James Webster, uh, hau, uh, nō te wako o tainui. Nō te whānau uerata, a raua ko tana, a nō Ngāti Mahuta, nō Ngāti Mania Poto. A, I te puake au i o tāhuhu, e te noho, noho au i tēnei wā kei a, te taro o te ika. A, e, ki te mahi tonu au, te haere tonu au nā, nā mahi toi, a, nā taonga pūro i tērā te tahi tino manawa māku kei rotu i te ao nei. So, koe nei, e, ka tatu atu nei, uh, e, ki te kōrero e pāna tēnei kaupapa haumanu, koe nei o nga kōrero e pāna nga taonga pūro. So, tēnei te mihi, uh, e nei rā te mihi atu ki a koe, nau mai, tau mai. Tēnō rawe i te whakawhiti kōrero i te te rangi nei, nga kōrero kei, kei mui a taua. Tēnā koe. Nga mihi nei, ki a koe e hoa. E James, uh, he tino honore ki te kōrero ki a koe, ngā mihi huki ki a katoa katoa huri noa te mutu. Ko hei pipi te maunga, ko waiohi ngā ngā te awa, ko pētani te marae, uh, ko ngāti whakari te hapu, ko ngāti kahanganu te iwi, uh, ko tarana ki te maunga, ko manua pau me ngā hape ngā awa, ko mere mere te marae, ko ngāti hene te hapu, ko ngāti ruanui te iwi. Nā reira, tēnā katoa katoa. Well, tell us a bit about yourself and your background in Taonga Pūoro. Well, my involvement with Taonga Pūoro, uh, well, is really from a different perspective to a practitioner because of my museum background. I'm more of an advocator for the movement, you know, especially in terms of thinking about what museums could be doing to support the rejuvenation of Taonga Pūoro. Uh, so I think the Haumanu Kaupapa uh, is more of a cultural reclamation which is a form of liberation in a museum context, you know, that can transform museum practice. So my background is, is museums and that is my kaupapa in terms of my relationship with the uh, Haumanu group. So all of these ideas I explored in, uh, in my studies for uh, master's thesis through Massey University in 2015. Susan Abasa was my supervisor. And she was really encouraging and, and knew it was important to document and reflect on the kinds of issues that cultural practitioners have with museums. So I'm, I'm really privileged to know a lot of the Haumanu Fano, like yourself, James, over the years and have participated in wānanga uh, exhibitions and public events to Tautoko 
through my former work as a museum curator for uh, Te Papa Tongarewa. So how long were you sort of <laughs> at Te Papa for? That will reveal my age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I started working at the National Museum in 1989 and that was through an initiative by uh, Master Kava Rangihitit and his wife Master Weaver Erino Pukitapuhitit. The course was for Māori to train in museums and it really came out of a hui that Kaumatua had after the Te Māori exhibition that toured the United States from 1984 to 86 and then returned that year to tour uh, museums around the country. It was a pivotal exhibition that uh, changed the way that museums really understood Māori and the continuing connection that we have to our taonga. So the Te Whanau Panake training course really came out of the Te Māori exhibition and, and I was really fortunate to be one of the uh, trainees on that course. Yeah, awesome, because I was talking to Brian and I mentioned O Maka Marae down in Blenheim, which is actually when I first met you, you and um, Shane Pasini. I think you might have turned up there as students of the museum curating mm. sort of scene. Mm. And um, yeah, I distinctly remember you guys there, which was also my first introduction to meeting Helene Melbourne, Richard Nunn's Brian Flintoff, Rangi Nui Kef was there at the time. And it was quite fleeting, but um, I do remember that and that's been quite a pivotal point in my life since back then as well. So, yeah, so it was around that late 80s that that Ngāpuna Waihanga hui started. And I know that Haumanu had a lot to play with things happening at Te Papa over the years as well. I remember seeing some photos of, um, of some big dawn opening that happened out there on the balcony with Pukaias playing, stuff I couldn't be there myself, but I saw Bernard Makawari and Rangi Skipper as well and all the Te Papa staff. And I do know as well that you guys sort of like organised the Haumanu crew at uh, Te Papa and were quite um, prolific in nurturing the Tonga Pool or Kaupapa there and utilising it as part of to Papa, so yeah, I was wondering whether you could just talk to us a little bit about that and um, yeah, how Haumanu played a part in um, To Papa over the years. Well, perhaps I'll start with my first introduction to the power of Taonga Puoro and I'll go back to the first time I was given a Toroa wingbow, uh, which was a koha from my boss at the time, Betty McFadgen. Betty was the head of the ethnology department at the National Museum in New Zealand before Te Papa. That's where I started. And uh, it was back in 1989. You know, I was a trainee on the uh, uh, Fano Panaki course and um, Betty gave me this toroa uh, wing bone and she said that uh, our tipuna used to make uh, kuaua from them. So I thought, wow, that, that's that's really amazing. And uh, a carver I knew, uh, Hone Manuko drilled the winewine and added some hai hai, uh, you know, a little flourish at the waha. And that was my first puoro. So, uh, ko te ingoa o tōku taonga tuatahi, uh, ko roimata toroa. And to me, it symbolised a connection to my early days at the National Museum and my own special taonga, inspired by our tipuna puoro in the museum collection that were lying silent in their drawers. And I still have it, you know, it has a special place in my whānau of Puoro. But then it wasn't until 1995 when I first really became fully aware of the potential of the Taonga Puoro revival through meeting Ngā Mātua, uh, Hedini Melvin, um, Brian Flintoff and Clem Mellish in that meeting. And I do recall our hui back at Omaka Marae, James, where I'd met you. But at that time, I was kind of more focused on the revival of Mahi Kohatu and Dante Bonaka and Mary Ann Turner were at that wānanga as well. So I was captured by the mahi of reclaiming all that knowledge around stone technology. And I remember meeting you, but it wasn't until this meeting in 1995 that it captured me. 
So our boss at that time was um, Matua Cliff Whiting. He was the director of the new Māori department and he was also the first kaihotu for Te Papa. Back in 1989, you know, I was in the ethnology department. You know, ethnology is a really old-fashioned term and that's how the museum was back then. It was very mainstream. And uh, when um, the museum was restructured, the ethnology department was disbanded and we formed uh, the Māori department and Cliff was our kaihotu. And we were really lucky to have him lead us into a new era that saw the establishment of Te Papa Tongarewa in the waterfront building that would open in 1998. So there was you know, really interesting times of change. And anyway, at this meeting, it was Matua, Hirini, Brian and Clem and they came to talk about the aspirations and the aims of Haumanu. And Cliff, being an important person in the Māori art world, had a lot of influence and uh, knew of their calls. So asked us as staff, myself, Moana Davy, who was collection manager Māori, and a lady called Bronwyn Symes, as project manager, to join the meeting and, and discuss uh, what was possible. One of the main reasons for the meeting was to talk about the gifting of a collection of puoro made it a haumanu wānanga at Ōtata in Napier, and they wanted to gift this collection to the museum for the purposes of being accessible for researchers and people to study and play. And what was also discussed was their ideas on a touring exhibition to end in the new Te Papa Tongarewa uh, building, museum, and their future wānanga and music to be released as a CD. Oh, I remember that meant because it made a huge impact on me. Uh, Hedene gave a clear vision about the need to restore Māori knowledge and practice pertaining to Taonga Puoro. And he said that Māori thinking was different to ethnomusicologists, that Taonga Puoro are not classified according to type or function, but by the sounds, the purpose. Um, you know, things like peace, healing and mourning. So the group was exploring the sounds of nature, uh, insects and birds. According to Pūrāko, uh, stories relating to Taonga Pūoro, and it was re-establishing Māori ways of knowing and being that had been subjugated and suppressed for centuries through processes of colonisation. And Hidden, he talked about a whariki of Mātauranga Māori as a metaphor. And the last missing whenu or strand was the traditions and performance skills of Taonga Pūro. I mean, that was amazing to hear and it was really compelling. Most of all, it, it gave me a sense of purpose that Te Papa Tongarewa could be useful and really uh, helpful to our people in a meaningful way. And that really shifted my perception of museums and what I was actually doing there. So, yeah, it was pretty powerful. It was a powerful meeting and made a big impact. You talked about this collection being gifted to to Papa. Maybe you could... You know, shed a little bit of light on that and sort of how that came to be. And um, I do know that, you know, at times over the years we've run wānanga through to Papa and they've rolled out this um, tray of instruments that were, you know, what I call a handling collection, you know, that were used, utilised for people to play and experience Tonga Pūoro. Yeah, that's tied up with my journey in Pūoro and the influences I had. Mm, so, um, yeah, I considered that meeting in 1995 to be my awakening to Taonga Pūoro revival and, and the obligations that we had as uh, museum people to help it survive and thrive. So back then, myself and others were in full-time development mode for the day one Māori exhibitions for the opening of Te Papa Tongarewa in 1998. One of my responsibilities was to assist Haumanu in creating their exhibition segment in the Mana Whenua exhibition on Level 3 at Papa Tongarewa. And that was three years of intensive work, liaising with Hirini mainly. Um, Moana Davy and I attended a Haumanu Wānanga on Binding in 1995, which was incredible. 
Was that up in Auckland at Epsom, me? Eh? Yes, yes. That was the first time I met Warren and whatnot. That was my first real wānanga um, beside, you know, after I'd met them at Ōmaka, was my first um, wānanga with Haumanu on a kaupapa, which I think was the Kaupa. last of five wānanga that they were holding. Mm-hmm. And Binding was one of them. Charles Niho, he was there with Dante Bonake. They were sort of facilitating yep. the the binding techniques and stuff like that. And we also, I think we went to Auckland Museum and we looked through the inner casings of some of the tongue there because there were some open ones. So it was sort of like the, I suppose, you know, you had to open them up and create the inner structure to put back together for the binding and stuff as well. So that was that was awesome. And, you know, Warren Woolbrook uh, met there and we've been mates and collaborated as well over the years. So, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding us about that one. No, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it was a real, like, amazing time of people getting together and, like you say, meeting for the first time and really starting to vibe. So it was exciting for Moana and I because we were getting out of the museum and really mixing in with practitioners and understanding the movement and what was coming through with all the knowledge, learning and the practice and a whole heap of different creatives and people coming together for a common cause. I remember being on the Maho, we were at the Teachers Training College at Wintley at Epsom, yep, Epsom and, yeah. and just having a yarn with Matu O'Brien as we're peeling off the bark from the uh, kia kia vines and, um, you know, softening them up in the water and splitting them. You know, this was really awesome stuff that we never really got to um, have the opportunity to do when, when you're in an office and you're, you know, sitting in front of a computer and thinking about exhibition proposals and things like this. This was actually getting out and participating with people who are doing the business. So it was enlightening and you know, being able to make your own pu'oro, playing for the first time, listening to others, getting together in the evenings and hereni, making us think about ideas in a Māori way. Mm. It was cool. The Mana Whenua exhibition team was mostly Māori. Um, we had designers, interpreters, project managers and culture managers, and it was very full on. We were all Māori. Hidini was our main contact and liaison uh, through the exhibition development. And I remember the day uh, Matu Hidini flew down from Kirikiriroa to have a meeting with us. And he arrived with the biggest kite of puro I'd ever seen. It was just really huge. And those were the taonga from the wānanga that were to be gifted to the museum. There's quite a lot of mātauranga with those taonga and they were intended to be accessible and to be played by people that was the main intention for those taonga and at the time we thought yeah fantastic that's what we want to do but it actually became you know quite a complex thing to be able to achieve and unfortunately that was one of the stumbling blocks that we had with trying to put together an exhibition that would fulfill the aspirations of haumanu Uh, it was difficult to be able to play some of those instruments because of health and safety issues Mm -hmm. And a lot of the taonga ended up in the cases for the haumanu display and locked in there. So there were lots of things that were a disappointment on reflection. And we could have done a lot better. So it was definitely a learning. Yeah, I suppose all the bureaucratic processes within the Institute, eh? Yeah, sadly. But there are, you know, we we have learned a lot from that experience. And um, there are definitely ways that you could do things better now. Yeah, so talking about major influences, um, you know, they've been both Māori and non-Māori and, and um, practitioners. And concerning Tonga Pūoro, you know, Ngā Mātua or Haumanu definitely have been a huge influence. And then the next generation of inspirers, you know, including yourself, James, or, um, Warren, uh, Rangiiria Headley, Pōtaka Taite, Rangi Kipa, uh, John Collins, Bernard Makuare, Rebe Spragan, mm. uh, Ricky Bennett, Charles Royal, you know, from the Wananga in the mid-1990s. And then later, Horumona, Ariana, 
Al Fraser, Tamihana, lots of others who joined the Haumanu Kaupapa that Te Papa were beginning to engage with. So the day we opened Te Papa Tongarewe, as you mentioned, was unbelievable. Hirini, uh, Richard Ma on the Pufara outside the marae of Te Papa at dawn, heralding in the day. And as the sun rose, we could see the crowds of people emerging out of the dark and there was just thousands all around the building surrounding the whole place. It was just incredible. And it was then that we realised we were part of history, giving over the museum to the people and the sounds of Puoro were interwoven indelibly into the fabric of Te Papa Tongarewa. And that's why I think Haumanu as the kaupapa is connected to Te Papa Tongarewa as our place through all our interactions over the years. So there's this incredible bond that's there and should always be there because of that, because of the relationships that we've built. That's amazing. I know you've talked about, you know, your main thing has been working in the museum, but, you know, as you've grown with Tonga Puoro and participated in many wānanga and things over the years, are you interested in particular instruments? You know, have you got particular pūrāko, um, tikanga, atua pertaining to, you know, particular Tonga Puoro? Yep, well, primarily I, I see myself as a curator, researcher, writer, and now I'm a teacher in Museum and Heritage Studies at Te Ringa Waka Victoria University, um, Wellington. But over the years, my involvement with Tanga Puoro has been to support the movement as a living cultural practice. But I have been fortunate to have been given different Tanga Puoro over the years. And so in my own time, I've been able to bond with those Tanga. And I don't have a particular area where I've concentrated my efforts on. But I do have a pukaia that has been made with the help of um, Warren and uh, others at a wānanga that we held at Hongoe Kamarai where I live. Gosh, and you were there too, James. You know, we were we were all together with Te Papa staff um, learning about different forms of puoro. So the pukaia to me is uh, pretty, it's an amazing um, instrument and I remember being influenced by seeing a wahine at a pōhiri to a wānanga that you'd organised, James, in, in the Coromandel and it was on manu. Kalanga manu, yeah. And anyway, at this pōhiri, she came up with this huge pukaia that she just went, Aah! I remember looking around and go, whoa, Amazing, man. You know, he wahine Māori ngari, she's playing this pukaia, which I thought was just just wicked. Since that time, I thought, oh, man, I'd love to be able to have a pukaia of my own. So, yeah, I think I'm more of a person who's a a supporter of the kaupapa. And in that, I've been... um, able to explore Taonga Puoro and the, and the revival as a living cultural practice and a cultural pedagogy. And that's something that generates knowledge, shapes values and constructs identity. That, that, that's a, a theory that comes from some scholars, Denzin and Lincoln. But I like what they say because I think it's true. And any form of Māori practice, like weaving, like a tanga pūoro, has those aspects, generates knowledge, shapes values and constructs identity. In my studies, one of the main aspects that was brought out was the conflict and the irony of museum practice. And an example of that is a statement that Richard made about museums. And he said that the ultimate fiction is somehow you're preserving the life of these taonga, when in fact you are not. You're presiding over their death. That's so true. Museums have this way of thinking that they can preserve the physicality of objects, 
but in doing that, they're making it really hard to continue the practice. Mm-hmm. And that happened when we were developing the home money exhibition. We were locking up the very taonga that was supposed to be accessible to researchers and to be played by people. Mm. You know, it's not what we want to do. So Richard noted that museum attitudes and policies were inconsistent and subject to change depending on staff and trends at the time, yep. ranging from laissez-faire, which is anything goes, to a, a lack of enforcement uh, to total restricted access. There was no rhyme or reason, just depending on the people and how they felt. Yeah, it was in top of the picking order and made the rules. Oh, so one of Richard's memories is a, is a really good example of a visit that he made to a German museum. And he described approaching a secluded location and having to wade through long grass to the entrance, like pushing your way through a paddock. And, you know, there was no friendly greeting or anything. It was only instructions to don gloves and go to the collection area. And the staff, he said, that worked there had been there for about 30 to 40 years and they had dedicated their lives to looking after the collections. And as the staff brought out the taonga for viewing, Richard was thinking, oh, you know, what could he do? And he had purposefully not put on gloves to be able to touch and play the instruments. And he described the experience. And I've just got the thesis here and I'll just read a little bit of what he had Okay, he goes, they brought out a tray of instruments. I started to move them a little to see if I could see the inside. The staff did nothing. I turned it a little, they did nothing. In a Germanic way, saying nothing was their way out. If they said something, they would be obliged to follow through. I got braver and braver and ultimately, very carefully, began to pick them up. So that's what Richard said about that experience. The staff didn't say a word. Richard knew that their museum protocols were being broken, but they didn't say or do anything. Richard believes that what they were begging to happen in their silence was to hear the instruments played. And he said, in their silence, they urged me on, urged me on. And of course, I obliged. Of course, yeah. as Richard would. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a crazy world, museums. I'm really hoping that eventually we'll get to a point in time when we're able to really express ourselves as Māori mm-hmm. and um, do what we need to do to help release taonga that are trapped in museums and lying silent in their jaws. <laughs> What are your aspirations for Tonga Puru and how can this be strengthened with our people? Hi. Okay, much well, Richard and Brian um, have spoken about different projects over the years that I think are important to fulfil. Before I left Papa Tongarewa in 2015, I'd worked on an exhibition idea that was modular and performance driven um, with workshops and it could tour around the country and perhaps even overseas that was about the journey of Haumanu and Richard in particular was really excited by that idea. Norman Hickey, a photographer and I had documented uh, much of Richard talking about aspects of his Puoro collection and that is a rich uh, archive in Te Papatongariwa. Norman had a great idea of filming Richard in the Nelson Provincial Museum, talking about and playing and bringing to life a really exquisite putoreno from the William Oldman collection in that museum. And that's available on YouTube. So we were starting to push important issues into the public forum, such as why is it important for practitioners to have access to taonga puoro in museums? And I'd like to keep that critique going. Uh, to question museum practice. So, you know, there's little excuse to gatekeep. There's also lifetimes of research that needs to be done on taonga that are currently in museums around the world that have very little information. It's estimated that there are about 16,000 taonga Māori in museums across the world. There needs to be considered effort in that area, I believe. And I find... Museum practices overall are very slow to respond. Uh, It's conflicted and it's paradoxical. You know, on one hand, 
reforming attitudes to do with colonialism and restoration and nationalism. <laughs> On the other hand, it institutes them. Mm-hmm. So even though, you know, we had a group of Haumanu Kita Papa staff that was born out of the Haumanu Kaupapa of inclusivity and embedded Kaupapa Māori in museum practice, it was driven by the passion of the staff. You know, it wasn't formalised by Te Papa and therefore it lacked support for succession. Mm-hmm. And therein lies structural issues, I believe, and, and I can't see any real progress happen until that's addressed. I think it's been left to languish. Mm. So I think there's there's a lot of reconnection work to be done between Taonga museums and their communities, practitioners in particular, Taonga Puoro, uh, Taonga Hauora, and museums have a big part to play in realising that. But yeah, definitely there's a lot of mahi to do and I know that, you know, Haumanu have had awesome ideas and we really need to start thinking about how we're going to do those. And Haumanu Collective, is, as far as I'm concerned, has been doing a fantastic job and um, I'm really excited to be uh, on board somehow to help, as always. So, yeah, mahi a te mahi. Yeah, because I was talking to Jerome and we talked about the, the art of uh, healing amidst the, the revival and development as well. It was more about just running wānanga, getting people engaged with Tonga Pūoro, making as many Tonga Pūoro as we can to put out there, sharing like, like a small sport of information about Tonga. But now, you know, we're finding new wave of Pūoro players and people coming through but we're trying to sort of revive different practices around uh, uh, midwifery, you know, birthing practices of Tonga Pūoro, Oroatsua, uh, Rungwauoro, you know, sound healing journeys with um, Tonga Pūoro, like putting the, the healing practices or theories back into practice. And only through practicing those things we can sort of learn more about how they, they actually work in real time. You know, as opposed to, you know, having read, oh, the pūmotomoto was used to play over the front and now of the child at birth and all that sorts of kōrero, but actually taking the time out to do those studies but put them into practice, which is sort of like that's sort of where things are happening now. Mm. I really think that it would be timely to have some sort of touring exhibition that focuses on Tonga Pūoro in its many different forms, but more as a people-focused rather than object-focused exhibition and be able to move around the country, overseas, wherever, be more agile as an exhibition. I think that that it's timely now for us to do because Tonga Pūoro, you know, it's everywhere now, isn't it? And hard to believe that Once upon a time, no one knew anything about the um, ancestral instruments like we do now. And as you say, uh, we're definitely moving into the aspect of healing, which is awesome. So there's many different strands that we can pick up in doing something like that. So what about for yourself? How do you see Tonga Pūru in your life? sort of moving forward and we've sort of reconnected with the Homo New Collective and stuff because for myself too, collective consciousness is awesome, you know, to help strengthen your passions, which, you know, for myself, definitely passionate about Tonga Pūoro. Where does that sit for you? I'd like to explore more the wahine aspects, uh, mainly to do with the connection between uh, Henero Katauri and Henete Iwiwa, Henero Amua the kūrāko, the kōrero, or the whakapapa that, that is connected between those atua. I've done a lot of work with in terms of te mahi or te whareporā. And so it's, it's led me to try to uncover and bring out more of those female elements that are so important to our understanding of te ao Māori. So those areas that I would like to focus more on in the future and to me it's more about a weaving together of aspects awesome 
Yeah, yeah Henny Wheeling and yeah, Ariana, um, Ruby Solly, mm. you know, and quite a cluster of women practitioners are, yeah, you know, having wānanga around that, mm-hmm. you know, at present time. Yep. We had one hui, but it was more of a coming together. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's Julie Noa Noa. And I would like to acknowledge to um, Aroha Yates and her mahi oh, yes. and her rangahau in the past, looking at uh, Hene Tiwiwa and all the different other wahine atua that she's searched out and have brought forward. So, yeah, there's all this mātauranga that um, I feel is, is needing to be picked up again. And I know other, other wahine are also doing that, so that's really encouraging. Awesome. Any closing for Karo you'd like to share? Uh, I just feel humbled. I do. I'm really humbled. I just think it's amazing to be part of uh, uh, this incredible journey. Uh, has a, an amazing ability to change the world. Ngā mihi nui, kia koe, kia koutou katoa. He mihi ana, kia koe anō um, awhina, mō whakāro, hi kōrero pāna tō hairinga, hi te arapūro, uh, yeah, hi rau i te noi te kōrero, te whakawhiti, whiti whakāro, you know, ki a hoki mai ma, mau maharatangi e pāna nga wānanga, pāna e rā kōrero, you know, e pāna e rā tangata, you know, ko wehe atu ki te pō, tino mihi ki a rātau, ki a, um, you know, whāra ki hea, o e nei o nga taonga, o e nei o nga wānanga, yeah, mā tātou anō i re 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 haere tonu i rungi i te mato o te whenua. So, ko e nei ki te tino mihi atu ki a koe, Ki te tatu mai nei, uh, mo tēnei kaupapa, te te kōrero e au kōrero e pāna e tō mōhi o tanga. So e ngā mihi, um, e nā te, nā te uh, karakia kua o te pai tō taua nei kōrero, ke wanganui a taua, e mihi ake ki iwe rō nā tanga te kia whakarongo mai nei. Uh, ki tēnei o nā uh, podcast mihi ki, uh, mō Haumanu, uh, Haumanu Collective, Haumanu Whānau, Haumanu Whānui, e mihi ake. Uh, uh, ko tau ai te Mauri, uh, te Mauri oho, te Mauri ārangi, te Mauri āpapa, te Mauri āi o te aho tapu e. Ko tau mai te Mauri, te Mauri o Ngātua, ko tau mai te Mauri, te Mauri o Ngātūpuna, ko tau mai te Mauri, te Mauri o te Tangata, ko tau ai, tō ai, tā te Mauri e, hui e, hui e. Tai ki. Ko te piko, te mahuri, ko ia te tipu a te rakaui. Heri tata ngā tā.